Welcome back to another Shamshir Sound video. Today we're talking about VST2 versus VST3. What are the differences and will we notice real world performance differences inside of FL Studio 21? If you guys are enjoying these quick videos, remember to smash up the like button and let's get started. Number one, more efficient processing. VST3 is designed so that it only performs processing when there is an audio signal present. This means that CPU resources aren't wasted during silences, unlike VST2, which would keep processing active, regardless of whether there's any actual audio signal at that point in time. This makes VST3 more resource efficient and potentially increases the number of plugins you can use in a project without overloading your system. Now, important disclaimer, ImageLine has had Smart Disable in FL Studio for many years. It's existed since I first began using FL Studio. In my testing, I saw no difference using a variety of effects, variety of synthesizers, and this could also be subject to the implementation of the developer. Also, I think this will benefit other DAWs a lot more since ImageLine has had Smart Disable, which pretty much does a similar thing. When you're not playing back audio, it frees up resources from your CPU. Adaptive input and output. Traditional VST instruments featured a fixed number of inputs and outputs. Separate versions of plugins had to be implemented for stereo and surround sound processing. Multi-output instruments usually took up a large number of channels, even if not all of them were being used. This again would lead to the wastage of resources. I think this is an edge case user. I think most users are just dealing with stereo. They're just doing basic stuff. They're not doing 5.1 or 7.1. So most people are just doing stereo. Enhanced MIDI handling. VST3 plugins can provide a dedicated event handler bus, which allows for a wide variety of control and modulation messages beyond traditional simple MIDI messages. In fact, support isn't only limited to the MIDI protocol and other future controls may utilize these functions. Advanced control of MIDI at a notes level is now supported. For example, a particular event like a pitch bend can be associated with a specific note with a unique note ID so that the modulation is applied to only that note, even in a polyphonic context like playing a chord. So this is gonna allow much more granular control with the sophistication of the MIDI notes, not just basic notes coming in. So I think that's gonna allow a lot more flexibility in the composing. Support for multiple MIDI IO. So with VST2, a particular plugin could only be assigned to single MIDI input and output. Now with VST3, plugins can support several MIDI ports at once, which can be switched on the fly. This opens up a lot of possibilities while performing music live and allows for more flexible routing. Again. This is more of an edge case, but if you guys are doing MIDI stuff live, I mean, again, this is like an edge case user. More organized automation parameters. Earlier, trying to find a particular automation parameter could get annoying when having to scroll through potentially hundreds of parameters in a VST2 plugin. Some DAWs provide an option to search for parameters from the list, but VST3 has added the ability to categorize automation parameters within the plugin itself. Guys, we have the last tweaked. We have lots of great controls that have circumvented the limitations of VST2. That would have been a nightmare for me to go through like a list of categories of like, can you imagine trying to choose manually from like Omnisphere or something if you didn't have like last tweaked? Simple stuff that probably most people, including myself, took for granted in FL Studio. So shout out FL Studio for having so many great things that have already, these mean nothing to us. They don't really have a inherent benefit. Audio inputs with VST instruments. So we usually associate VST instruments with MIDI input only, but VST3 adds the ability to route audio to plugins, which opens up new possibilities. For example, a synth plugin with a built-in vocoder can now take an audio signal as an input, as well as the MIDI data for modulation. So that helps with simplifying routing, not having to do multiple routing, just sending right to one, sending the audio, sending the MIDI data right to one. When I think of this, I think of vocal synth from Isotope. So they probably have capitalized on this feature. This also makes side chaining and cross modulation possible independently from the DAW's built-in capabilities. This one's my favorite, resizable GUI, a small but significant improvement, allows people to dynamically adjust the screen however big or small as they need. So allowing VST3 plugins to be scaled in size as required to free up or take up screen space as required. So let's take a look at an example. 
On the right, we have Pro-C from FabFilter VST3. On the left, we have the same plugin, but VST2. And we can see that there is no ability on the VST2 to adjust the size. Now, you do have three presets. You can cycle through presets, but VST3 allows you to do whatever you'd like. You can get very granular with the control in addition to customizing presets. So that I just love. Sample accurate automation. This means that VST3 can read and write automation data at a very high resolution down to sample level, entailing that automation remains highly accurate even for very rapid and minute changes. You guys who love doing automations, this is gonna be great. It's gonna be more granular and precise control. Remote control of plugins via VST XML with the increasing popularity of portable control surfaces being used in music production and live performance. VST XML provides enhanced flexibility for remote controlling plugin parameters from various control services. So we can see a lot of great improvements for live audio. Multilingual support. This is great. VST3 uses text in the Unicode format, which allows for special characters and non-English characters. This means that it is easier to localize plugins in various languages for developers. Here we have a VST2 project. We will test performance. We have Pro Q3, Pro C2, Pro MB, and 10 instances of Pro L2. We can see that we're idling at about 31%, give or take. Uh, sometimes it goes up, now down to 30, 31, 32, 34. So basically around 30. Smart disable has been turned on in the audio settings. So idling around 31 to 33, let's see where the CPU goes when we play back. Playing back the project, we can see we went up 50, 49, 51, 48, 49. So around 49, I would say. So we pretty much went to 50 and then we come back to 30, 31. 30, 31 idle and going up to 4950 when we're playing back the audio. All the same presets, all the same plugins, but all of them are VST3 version. The RAM difference is negligible. I think it's a margin of error. It could be more, it could be less in different settings. And again, 30, 31, I don't see any difference there. Smart disable is on. And we can see the performance is basically identical. 49, 48, 50, basically in that same range, 48, 49. Uh, RAM again, like I said, basically the same. Here we have 16 instances of VST2 Tone 2 Gladiator, all windows closed. Again, Smart Disable is globally on. We have idle CPU at 4%. We have about under 2,500 megabytes being used. And let's go ahead and play back and see where we spike to. So we're using a layer, activating all 16 synths. Uh, we're going up 10, 11, we touch 12. Again, 10, 11 in that range. So let's stop the project, see what we come down to. I think we peaked at 12 and we come back to four. So four is pretty much our idle going up to 12, four to 12 and sitting around 2,500 megabytes with all windows closed again. A smart disable is globally on. Now we have 16 instances of VST3 Tone 2 Gladiator. Same project, exact same notes will be played we can see that the idle CPU is about the same, 4%. There's a little increase in RAM, but I think it's just a margin of error. I don't think it's something to make a conclusion about with something like 70 or 80 megabytes. And again, it could fluctuate. It could just be a margin of error. Interesting. Well, we didn't touch 12. Maybe there's a slight, maybe there's a tiny bit of CPU optimization, a tiny bit. But again, it's hard to tell because there's so many other factors. We touched 12. So my conclusion so far is that idle CPU usage is the same. CPU usage when you're playing back audio is the same. RAM give or take is the same. It looks like your results may vary depending on the sophistication of your project. One thing that I would say is that I love the improved routing and I do love the resizable user interface. In performance regards, I don't see any big difference in regards to performance. Let me know what you guys think about this video. Let me know what results you guys had testing VST2 and VST3. If you guys enjoyed this video, remember to smash up the like button, smash the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and hopefully one day Umet Ozcan releases 64-bit Genesis Pro. That's all I want for Christmas. All right, guys, have a great day. Take care.